knew this was going to be a reunion, but I had no idea on how many levels this reunion would be. I see so many friends and familiar faces uh, among you. And actually, it turns out that uh, a man who held me in his arms when I was just a baby is also here, Dr. Ahmed. So I had no idea. <laughs> And of course, uh, my specialization is Islamic economics, and uh, it's very fitting that uh, this would be the El Alwani lecture, because uh, Dr. Taha was the one who had authorized me to go to E.F. Schumacher's library in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, uh, where I uncovered his unpublished uh, lecture notes from the 1960s, and discovered that E.F. Schumacher, who is a renowned economist, I don't know if you're all familiar with him, but uh, probably the most important economist of the last century from a religious perspective. And I had read his biography written by his daughter and came across these incredible uh, notes, excerpts from lecture notes, and I thought, I've got to get my hands on these. And these are just too important. So I proposed the idea to Dr. Taha that I would go up to the Schumacher Library, expecting to get my, whole, my hands on these uh, great lecture notes, and then use that to inform my own thinking of Islamic economics. And lo and behold, as I was going through his library, I found that he had all of the books of the same Muslim philosophers and scholars that I was familiar with. And I was stunned. And I found that he took very careful notes in the books on the front and back pages and had underlined them very extensively. Whereas he wasn't doing that in contemporary Catholic writers that he was reading. I mean, Jacques Maritain is important as, as he is. And I further discovered from the lecture notes that he was writing in German the notes from the German edition of, of the books of these Muslim philosophers. And it turns out that E.F. Schumacher had recovered his faith by reading the books of these contemporary Muslim philosophers. And so I thought, no wonder I love Schumacher so much. I mean, there's this kind of natural affinity. Uh, and so that's really led to a project that is going, a publication uh, that's going to be coming out next year, inshallah, God willing, uh, called not by bread alone, E.F. Schumacher and the perennial philosophy, in which he really brings to bear the principles of interfaith dialogue and applies that to economic matters. So I'd like to frame much of our discussion today in terms of the writings of uh, E.F. Schumacher. Now, E.F. Schumacher uh, begins his book, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered. That's really his classic book written in the 1970s by saying that it's a myth that we have solved the problem of production. We often think that we've solved the problem of production, but he begins the book by saying we have not. And that actually we are living off of capital rather than income. And this was before the oil crisis had hit in the 1970s, so you can imagine when that hit, this book became really a bestseller. And so he was talking about the idea that we are not only living on our capital rather than income in the sense of depleting non-renewable resources, but also that we are, in a sense, depleting our social capital. And we'll get into some of the reasons for that and its connection with uh, economic, uh, economics and production processes and exchange processes. <coughs> and most importantly, we're depleting our environmental capital. And that's become very pronounced, obviously, with climate change and so forth. I don't know what the winter has been here in Washington mild. this year. Yeah, mild. In Cincinnati, uh, my colleagues are telling me this is the warmest winter they've ever experienced in their lives. And people are a little disoriented, quite frankly, and wondering what's, what's going on. And so we can have a sense of that with the, the fact that we're living off of this environmental capital with climate change. And so he suggests, he begins his book by saying, we have not solved the problem of production. We think we have, but we haven't, because we're living off of capital rather than income. And so I would like to relate that to the idea that, to Islamic economics, in terms of the idea that work is supposed to fulfill a hierarchy of spiritual and other needs. Uh, and if work 
was not compatible with fulfilling our, not only our material needs, but our spiritual needs, we'd have to ask a very, you know, that would put us in a paradoxical situation. We'd ask, have to ask, how is it that God has made a mistake? <laughs> I mean, really, that's what, it, as Brian Keeble says, that how it ever came about that in order to sustain his earthly existence, man in the all-inclusive sense, man and woman, should be obliged to follow a course of physical action that seems a direct denial of our deepest nature, as if by some ghastly mistake of his creator, it is man's destiny to follow a direction that leads him away from the very thing it is his nature to be. If we are to avoid such a dilemma, we must conclude that in some way work is or should be profoundly natural and not something that must be avoided or banished as beneath our dignity. And of course, the way that modern economics treats work is that it's a disutility, something to be avoided precisely uh, what, uh, you know, what is being suggested here. So, if work is not only supposed to help us keep us alive, but is also supposed to help us strive towards perfection in fulfilling a hierarchy of needs, then we can derive three purposes of human work. And E.F. Uh -huh. Schumacher articulates these as follows. First, to provide necessary and useful goods and services. Second, to enable us, every one of us, to use and thereby perfect our gifts like good stewards. And third, to do so in service to and in cooperation with others, so as to liberate ourselves from our own inborn egocentricity. So these are the three objectives of the work. The first is clearly material, but the second and third are really spiritual objectives of work. And of course, all economists recognize the first objective of work, uh, but some recognize, to some extent, the second and third objectives of work to various degrees, acknowledging that different types of work can have different effects. And so, for example, Adam Smith acknowledged the ongoing development of individual <coughs> gifts when he argued that an extremely high division of labor, employing few of our faculties, could have serious social costs by reducing certain human capabilities. And he says, the understandings of the greater part of men are necessarily formed by their ordinary employments. The man whose life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no, no occasion to exert his understanding. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. <laughs> but in every improved and civilized society, this is the state into which the laboring poor, that is, the great body of the people, must necessarily fall, unless government takes some pains to prevent it. And so Adam Smith's proposal was that, all right, after a day of dehumanizing work on the assembly line, <laughs> so to speak, we can just go home and read some poetry, and that will restore our humanity. <laughs> now, of course, John Ruskin and other very prominent uh, Christian uh, economists and artists object very strenuously to that, saying that's not going to do it, uh, obviously. And we'll come back to that critique of those types of production processes. But other types of figures, such as David Ricardo and James Mill, the father of John Stuart Mill, oppose this view, denying the existence of such harmful effects. What they asserted was that all types of work were homogeneous in terms of human development. In other words, everything is just a matter of matter in motion. So whether we're an architect on the drawing board or whether we're on the assembly line, those types of work are basically qualitatively the same. And so that would deny the second objective of work and not recognize that at all. And also, due to an anthropology that heavily emphasized psychological hedonism, because James Mill, the father of John Stuart Mill, was a psychological hedonist, as was David Ricardo, these thinkers also denied the possibility of liberation from egocentricity. So in other words, they eliminated the second and third objectives of work, 
leaving only the first objective of work in the realm of economics. Now, more recently, modern economists have kind of assumed that all types of work are homogeneous on one hand while asserting the legitimacy of all three objectives on the other. So you get a variety of all kinds of positions mixing and matching. And these various positions clearly have important implications for the link between ethics and economics, and therefore, good work and good works, the subject of our discussion. And to the extent to which economic realities can be governed by their own logic. In other words, whether economics can really be a separable, separable science from moral philosophy. Now, how do we relate all of this to Islam, if that's the setup of the general problem? On the one hand, Islamic law establishes a minimum division of labor to fulfill the first objective of work, asserting that some members of the community must practice each profession to fulfill the needs of society. So the division of labor, in this sense, would be analogous to other collective duties. So for example, somebody has to build orphanages. If nobody builds orphanages, then the entire community is held accountable before God on the day. Somebody has to build hospitals. If nobody builds hospitals, then once again the community is held accountable. And the same thing applies for every profession. So therefore, from the Islamic legal point of view, the division of labor is not just a right, but it's a spiritual duty. And that if some people fulfill that function in society, that relieves the rest of society of that collective obligation. So it's not something that each one of us have to do. Uh, w w prayers, for example, are something that each one of us would need to do. But these are collective duties that apply to economics. On the other hand, if this establishes the floor to the division of labor, the division of labor must also leave ample room for human creativity according to the Islamic intellectual heritage, which is distinct from the legal heritage. And that facilitates the second objective, to use and thereby perfect our gifts like good stewards. And so a too extreme division of labor creates an unsustainable trade-off between the various objectives of work, leading to lopsided development that fails to provide people with psychological and spiritual fulfillment, and that fails to keep nature clean and self-replenishing. And so such trade-offs from the Islamic point of view can only exist in the short or medium term, not the long term. And as Sayyid Hussein Nasser asserts, uh, equilibrium on the socio-economic plane is impossible to realize without reaching that inner equilibrium which cannot be attained save through surrender to the one and living a life according to the dictum of heaven. Of course, obviously, for those of you who are familiar with Islam, the key principle in Islam is tawheed, la ilaha illallah, which means that God is the source of all truth and all reality. And if God is the source of all truth and all reality, then he is the source of all that is positive on this level. Anything positive on this level of reality is a finite reflection of the infinite perfection of God. And therefore, we cannot have socio-economic equilibrium without being at peace with God, and therefore with ourselves and with our neighbors, and neighbor understood not just as human neighbors, but our environment, our environmental neighbor. So accordingly, only when the division of labor is above the minimum level required for the community's material needs and below the maximum level for human development, or between that floor and the ceiling, are all three objectives of work and integral human development possible from the Islamic point of view. And by human development, by integral development, we mean the development of the whole person and of every person. And so what I'd like to do is relate these objectives, this floor and this ceiling, <coughs> to what's called the Hadith of Gabriel. The Hadith of Gabriel is uh, uh, <coughs> saying with the Prophet, where the Archangel Gabriel comes to the Prophet of Islam and asks him, what is Islam? And he gives the five pillars, uh, the, the testimony of faith, 
the prayers, the alms, the zakat, the pilgrimage to the Hajj, and fasting, and so forth. And then he asks him, what is Iman? What is faith? And he says, well, to believe in God in the Day of Judgment, and his angels, and his prophets, in plural, his sacred texts, the Day of Judgment, and so forth. And then, what is Ihsan, which is excellence, virtue, deep spiritual realization? And he says, that is to worship God as if you saw him, and even if you don't see him, always be aware that he seeth thee. And of course, only the great saints can achieve that level of spiritual realization, because even the rest of us, when, even when we're praying and we're trying to concentrate on our prayers, after about 10 seconds, we think about the fact that we're concentrating, and then our <laughs> mind goes off. So only the great saints can achieve that level of spiritual realization. And so, basically, that Hadith of Gabriel with those three dimensions of Islam, the first dimension of Islam dealing with right action, and therefore addressing the body. The second dimension of Iman, right thought, right understanding, and therefore addressing the mind. And then that highest dimension of, is of is Ihsan, addressing right intention, and therefore the heart. The essence of Islam is the intersection of all three of these dimensions. And true Islamic economics is really also the intersection of all three of those dimensions. Because that first dimension of Islam determines Islamic law, which determines the floor to the division of labor. The second and third dimensions, the Islamic intellectual dimension and the mystical dimension, wind up determining the ceiling to the division of labor of what's possible for human development. So we can really relate these three objectives of work to the three dimensions of the Islamic tradition as articulated in the Hadith of Gabriel. And so what I'd like to do then is uh, kind of walk through that a little bit and, and unpack that and flesh that out and draw the implications for the link between ethics and economics from that point of view and therefore the relation to good work and good works from an Islamic perspective. Now, turning to the first dimension of Islamic law, we've talked briefly about how it is that Islamic law determines at least a minimum division of labor to fulfill that first dimension of work, given the need for us to kind of collectively fulfill our material uh, needs and wants. And so from this point of view, everything is sacred uh, in life because everything is ultimately attached to God. What would appear to be the most mundane of activities really has deep religious significance. So integrating all of life around a sacred center. And so it's very important and significant that on the first objective of work, Islamic law distinguishes between needs and wants. And that distinction is very critical because if we don't have the distinction between needs and wants, we really have no basis for ranking our priorities and therefore setting a ceiling to the division of labor. So I want to suggest the following, that Islamic law not only sets the minimum floor for the division of labor, but it contains within itself, in principle, the possibility for the establishment of a ceiling, without specifying the ceiling, because we're going to need the other dimensions of the Islamic tradition for that. But at least it's there in principle. And so uh, Many uh, scholars discuss this in terms of the objectives of divine law, which is discussed in terms of masalah. And uh, pardon me, I'm going to just make sure I'm all right on time. Mm -hmm. How much How much time do I have? How far have we gotten so far? Here you go. I have uh, 15, 17 minutes, maybe. 17 minutes? I, I, I've oh, no, no, we've gone 17. 17. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say I was. All right, very good. And so there's an intimate connection in Islamic law uh, in terms of these objectives of the divine law, which is called uh, masala, uh, that basically the objectives of divine law or the sharia are used to interpret Islamic positive law or fiqh in terms of the protection of one or more of these interests or masala. And it's very interesting, there's an immediate intimate connection between what is right and what is good in Islamic law. There's no divergence between the right and the good, as you have in secular approaches to philosophical ethics where you have utilitarian 
ethics on one hand, which defines, defines the good independent of the right and deontological ethics defining the right independent of the good. Islamic approach doesn't have that. It's that the right and the good go together. And so, uh, and it's, it's indicated in the very root of the word. And so jurists generally classify these masalah for human society into three different levels. The first level concerns fundamental necessities, daruriyat, such as the preservation of religion, life, posterity, intelligence, and property. So if we disregard any one of those fundamental uh, objectives, then what happens is that society will go into disequilibrium. It'll be chaos, and it will disintegrate. The next level are what you might call complementary needs, hajayat, which if unfulfilled, they lead to real hardship and distress, but not the ruin of the community. And then finally, supplementary benefits, tahsiniyat, involve the beautification of life and refinement and perfection of ethics. So based on this hierarchy, and this is broadly uh, defined, priority is given to higher level needs if there's a conflict with lower level needs or rights. And so important juristic principles that flow from this hierarchy include the averting of harm from the poor takes priority over the averting of harm from the wealthy. Or there shall be no damage and no infliction of damage. And the averting of harm takes precedence over the acquisition of benefits. And so these are some of the general principles. And of course, they need qualification, depending on the specific uh, economic context, to really apply them. But they have major implications for assessing production processes. Because on the one hand, it does establish that minimum floor for the division of labor in order to provide those useful and necessary goods and services on one hand, and the possibility of a maximum ceiling for integral human development on the other. But Islamic law cannot determine that ceiling by itself. It needs input from the other uh, intellectual sciences to do so. And in Islamic law, this is called ijtihad, to make an all things considered ethical judgment to address new situations that we have not encountered in the past is called ijtihad. And as Sheikh Taha, as I learned very well from Sheikh Taha, uh, Dr. Taha, Ijtihad is not just one judgment among other social, political, or economic judgments. It is itself an all things considered judgment that takes all of these other judgments into account. And so to really do Ijtihad properly requires not only the input of the Islamic legal sciences, but also the intellectual sciences and the inner dimension of the Islamic tradition to make that all things considered judgment for integral development. And so let me just give a, a, a quick example. Islamic law sets the conditions for work, <clears throat> such as rules that say that you're, you cannot build your house so high that it can look into the private space of your neighbor, for example. But you can build that house in 200 different ways. Right? And so how is it that we determine what is an Islamic design from, uh, and, and communicates, so you know, might say, silent theology, in a sense, from something that is completely un-Islamic or even anti-Islamic in its design that takes one away from the remembrance of God? That's going to require the intellectual sciences and the inner dimension of the tradition. So although Islamic law is necessary for any integral approach to Islamic development, it is not sufficient. <clears throat> and so Islamic intellectual and productive sciences are needed as well. For the norms and principles of Islamic art, and we have a, a major uh, Muslim artist, one of the nation's leading calligr Muslim calligraphers in the audience, so I feel a little bit embarrassed to be talking about some of these things <laughs> in front of him. Uh, uh, but uh, the norms and principles of Islamic <coughs> art are derived from the Islamic revelation and the inner dimension of the tradition that govern the making of things in, a, in an Islamic economy. And from this point of view, what we make, or our art, should communicate a spiritual truth and a presence analogous to nature or God's art. 
<clears throat> and therefore, there's a direct correspondence between the spiritual significance of nature, or God's art, and what we make, our art. And so, although Islamic law addresses what we do, what we make and how we make is addressed by other aspects of this tradition. And so the ethical aspect of this, of the work, of work in this case embraces also the aesthetic. And therefore the production process is conceived as and elevated to the level of the spiritual discipline, in which what one makes is an instrument of livelihood and devotion. And to quote a very famous saying of Ananda Kumar Swami, Every man is a special kind of artist in this perspective. The artist is not a special kind of man. There's an art to everything, to every discipline, when it's done properly, conceived properly. And so the link between metaphysics and cosmology on one hand, and the making of things on the other <coughs> hand, is to be found in Islamic doctrines regarding the correspondence between the cosmos, the macrocosm, and the soul, the microcosm. And it's really quite remarkable, this correspondence. It's even in the etymology of the term world, this correspondence. Does anybody happen to know the etymology of the word world, English. other than students of St. Nostra? The English word? <coughs> the English word world. Well, we all know werewolf, right? Where, man, wolf. So where? Where old, old man. The world is an old man. It's the macrocosm corresponds to the microcosm. Every, all of which derives from the metacosm, the divine principle below us. And so this kind of correspondence uh, between the, the, what we make and its spiritual meaning outwardly and its effect upon us inwardly is determined by this Islamic intellectual dimension the intellectual science and the philosophy of nature. So Islamic metaphysics and sciences and their nature therefore transform everything in the productive sciences from architecture and urban planning to the art of dress. That's why I've got a column this shirt. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> uh, and personal living space. And so the same applies to the practical sciences dealing with everything from social organization to the treatment of the environment. And so the link between work, spiritual education, and sacred ambiance forged by the Islamic intellectual sciences is crucial to fulfilling the three objectives of work and highlighting the interconnections between religion, economics, and civilization from the Islamic point of view. Now, from this point of view, competitive industrial production pro industrial markets necessarily and systematically de <coughs> work for efficiency gains. That's what industrial markets do. Uh, remember Adam Smith's example of the pin factory and the wealth of nature, nations that you have one person stretching out the wire, another person attaching the pin, another person unwinding. I mean, doing the same <coughs> step again and again and again. And that's what industrial production processes necessarily do to minimize cost, maximize productivity, maximize efficiency, it naturally, it necessarily de-skills the work. And so Schumacher, who was obviously highly critical of industrial production processes, and he was borrowing a lot from these Muslim philosophers who were commenting on the spiritual significance of work and production, and this reduction appro reductionist approach to man and nature upon which they're based, states that industrialism, industrialism as such, irrespective of its social form, stunts personality. Mainly by making most forms of work, manual and white-collared, utterly uninteresting and meaningless. <laughs> Mechanical, artificial, divorced from nature, utilizing only the smallest part of man's potential capabilities. It sentences the great majority of workers to spending their working lives in a way which contains no worthy challenge, no stimulus to self-perfection, no chance of development, no element of beauty, truth, goodness. The basic aim of modern industrialism 
is not to make work satisfying but to raise productivity. Its proudest achievement is labor saving, whereby labor is stamped with the mark of undesirability. But what is undesirable cannot confer dignity. So the working life of a laborer is a life without dignity. The result, not surprisingly, is a spirit of sullen irresponsibility, which refuses to be mollified by higher wage awards, but is often only stimulated by them. And that's quite an indictment. And so Ramakumara Swami uh, likewise argues, another great uh, Catholic uh, thinker, argues that only when an individual's body and soul can participate in his work, something never possible in a factory, can the medieval principle that to pray is to labor fully apply. And so what we want to emphasize here is that the economist cannot address these questions regarding the intertwining of this relation between ethics and economics and the three objectives of work and how to manage the trade-offs between them or the unsustainability thereof and so forth, qua economist. What really needs to happen is that the economist has to kind of kick this debate up to the philosophical and theological level where it really belongs. And in that regard, dialogue between theologians and economists is really urgently needed. So being in the Department of Theology at Xavier, I guess I'm in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> And in fact, there is an increasingly urgent debate over whether the secular paradigm that has indirectly created industrial production processes can generate new technologies quickly enough to solve the accompanying crisis related to the environment, depletion of environmental capital, depletion of non-renewable resources, and escapism, or the depletion of social capital. And so there's no question that the technology must change. If China and India industrialize, keep on industrializing the same way that the West has, the planet can't take it. I mean, it's as simple as that. It'll be collective suicide. And so the, the, there's no question that the technology must change. The only question is whether the paradigm within which the technology is developed must also change. So if the current reductionist paradigm does not correspond to the nature of reality, then attempting to find a technological fix within this paradigm can lead to a vicious cycle of technologies that backfire, ending in catastrophe. And so the point can be illustrated with the true story of a man. And this is a true story. It's uh, related by Edward Michan, a welfare economist who had a spot of arthritis in his finger joints, and so the doctor had given him tablets uh, to deal with this slight arthritis, but unfortunately that led to a stomach ulcer. And then a subsequent operation for the ulcer in conjunction with strong antibiotics interfered with his cardiovascular system <laughs> to the extent that the doctor felt obligated to carry out a couple of minor operations. Complications from those minor operations then required a heart specialist and in the patient's weakened condition contracted a lung infection. So the patient died within two weeks of the operations despite the continuous care of three doctors and the hospital staff. And so accordingly, what this story <coughs> illustrates is that if the paradigm that we're using does not correspond to the nature of reality, then anything that we do to address problems that are really res resulting from that paradigm, using the paradigm, leads to negative unintended consequences that just lead to this kind of vicious cycle. And so accordingly, those who hope for technological fixes within the current reductionist paradigm are arguably substituting a secular faith for a traditional religious one. And if you look at literally the history of the notion of progress with August Comte and you know this religion of progress. I mean, all the you know kind of the role, the, this kind of priestly role. I mean, it's really a parody of uh, religion. And so, therefore, the Islamic intellectual dimension has a great deal to say about what is the proper paradigm within which to develop these technologies. And I think that the the reason that Schumacher was so attracted to this is because, unfortunately, 
Uh, since the Galileo trial, and I think the church got a really bad rap with the Galileo trial, <laughs> uh, it was a possibility within Christianity to, in a sense, withdraw from the world of nature and leave that as a separate realm. But now with the environmental crisis, many Catholic scholars are trying to recover that theology of nature, to re-sacralize that, and to help, in a sense, uh, provide a new, more holistic framework within which to deal with these current crises and then to address some of these problems. And I think the reason Schumacher was so attracted to the Islamic intellectual uh, sciences was precisely because in the Islamic tradition, philosophy and theology never parted ways. With all that implies for the relationship between religion and science. And therefore, it provided, I think, a source of meditation for Schumacher to recover those elements of a traditional Christian theology of nature that could really address these problems. And so I think that's really interfaith dialogue at its highest level mm -hmm. and the most profound level. Now, many Muslim economists try to relink ethics and economics when it's too late, when they've already accepted many of the philosophical presuppositions <coughs> of secular approaches to economics. So in other words, you might say that uh, Muslim economists, the typical approach to Islamic economics is to use that one dimension of Islamic economic law and say, for example, Islamic finance. Islamic finance gets all the attention because the bankers have all the money. <laughs> but uh, they talk about Islamic finance, which deals with the legal dimension. And I don't mean to say that Islamic finance isn't important. But these other dimensions of the Islamic intellectual heritage and the inner dimension of the tradition are completely neglected. And therefore, it results in a kind of one-dimensional approach to economics rather than the three-dimensional approach that constitutes authentic Islamic economics. And it's that three-dimensional approach that's really necessary to address these problems. Because if we try to reinsert <coughs> ethics into economics, without addressing production processes, it's a non-starter. Neoclassical economists, with neoclassical economists, kind of modern mainstream economics, will respond in the following way. Economists such as Paul Haney, who got his PhD from uh, Chicago Divinity School. I'm not casting aspersions on anybody with that, but anyway. Paul Haney argues that a high division of labor makes economics amoral rather than immoral. And he argues it in the following way. He says, most of us behave courteously toward others, but we do not because we cannot put their interests ahead of our own. In families and perhaps small face-to-face -face communities, it is possible for individuals to sacrifice their interests to the interests of others. But in the large and unavoidably anonymous societies in which we produce for others and obtain from others most of what we need to live, our moral responsibility to others cannot be much more than to refrain from doing to them what we would consider unfair if done to us. Most of those who complain about the immorality quote unquote, of the marketplace have misread the situation. Market interactions are not less moral or more selfish than non-market interactions. But they are generally more impersonal. And that cannot really be changed without giving up the benefits derived from specialization. The greater range of more attractive choices that constitute an increase in wealth. So in short, impersonal exchange rather than immorality is simply the high price, uh, the, well, I'm inserting there, is <laughs> simply the price of high specialization and productivity. So if Muslim economists try to reinsert ethics and economics accepting this high division of labor that's above the ceiling, it's too late. How can we reinsert ethics and economics? It's impersonal. We don't know enough about one another in order to exercise that type of altruism to begin with. 
And so Haney's arguments, however, unravel the instant one asserts that an industrial economy has already surrendered the spiritual objectives of work. And we cannot make that argument from the point of view of aesthetic law alone. So Muslim economists who are trying to combine the Islamic law, Islamic economic law on one hand, and, accept, and neglecting the intellectual and inner dimension of the tradition on the other are in an impossible situation. It's, it's really very much the idea that you're using Islamic finance to finance very anti-Islamic things. <laughs> it's a really schizophrenic type of situation. And so Haney is correct to argue that impersonal exchange essentially de-links ethics and economics. That's really what it does at an individual level. And that this does not necessarily imply <coughs> morality. But to claim that delinking ethics and economics is amoral, not immoral, at the collective level, presupposes that either industrial production processes can accomplish all three objectives of work, or that the second and third objectives are not relevant to begin with. And so economists must therefore put forward <coughs> corresponding philosophical arguments to contend that conventional economic theory and praxis based on impersonal production and exchange processes are amoral rather than immoral. And so industrial, if that's the case against industrial capitalism, industrial socialism is even worse. We, won't, we don't have too much time uh, to get into that. How much time do we have? You're almost there. Almost there? Wow. All right. I better go quickly then. Because basically what industrial socialism presupposes is that we can coordinate the production processes among producers. About five minutes. All right, so that if somebody kind of, if one producer um, cuts back on production and another one has to kind of take up the slack or somebody does more, you have to coordinate among all the producers. But if you're not fulfilling the second objective of work, then what's going to happen is you're going to have egoism come into the coordination problem. And so it's impossible to solve, assuming there's even a solution to the coordination problem to begin with. So I don't have much time to go into that, but basically the bottom line is, is that industrial socialism will lose the three objectives of work even more quickly than industrial capitalism. So it's very appropriate that there have been very serious critiques of industrial socialism from that point of view. Therefore, from the Islamic point of view, fulfilling all three objectives within work is necessary, for they ultimately stand or fall together. And it's therefore appropriate that uh, the connection between religious beliefs and economic praxis is particularly clear in that esoteric dimension of the tradition, or the dimension of ihsan or right tension, uh, uh, intention, which has always been closely wed to the Islamic production of sciences. I'll just give a quick example. Yusuf Ibish points out, for example, the Damascene weavers uh, preceded their work by hours, if not days, of spiritual preparation. Uh, prayers, meditation, contemplation, all integrated, uh, integral to the creative process, at the end of which a beautiful design would emerge. Uh, and one could say the same thing for calligraphers and those in other traditions. And so I'm not suggesting that, uh, that we, in a sense, go back to pre-modern production processes. But what I am suggesting is that we need to look at modern science and technology, integrate that within higher orders of knowledge, and be able to select and properly apply this to the development of new, more holistic approaches. And this can only be done through uh, that intellectual and esoteric dimension of the tradition. Now, I'm going to uh, conclude with just two anecdotes. One is from uh, a book by Titus Burkhardt who masterfully sums the current situation of traditional craftsmen in the Islamic world. This will be a little bit depressing, and then I'll conclude with the, the opposite about what's the hope for the future. Uh, Titus Burkhardt says, I knew a comb maker who worked in the street of his guild. He was called Abdulaziz, the bondsman of the Almighty, and always wore a black jellaba, the loose hooded garment with sleeves, and a white turban with the, lithem, the face veil, which surrounded his somewhat severe features. He obtained the horn from, for his combs from ox skulls, which he bought from butchers. He dried the horned skulls at a rented place 
removed the horns, opened them lengthwise, and straightened them over a fire, a procedure that had to be done with the greatest care, lest they should break. From this raw material, he cut combs and turned boxes for antinomy on a simple lathe. This he did by manipulating with his left hand a bow which, wrapped around a spindle, caused the apparatus to rotate. I've seen a film of this. It's absolutely amazing. In his right hand, he held the knife, and with his foot, he pushed against the counterweight. As he worked, he would sing Quranic surahs in a humming tone. I learned that, as a result of an eye disease which, is, disease, which is common in Africa, he was already half blind, and that, in view of long practice, he was able to feel his work rather than see it. One day, he complained to me that the importation of plastic combs was diminishing his business. It is only a, it's not only a pity that today, this is his quote, it's not only a pity that today, solely on account of price, poor quality combs from a factory are being preferred to much more durable horn combs, he said. It is also senseless that people should stand by a machine and mindlessly repeat the same movement while an old craft like mine falls into oblivion. My work may seem crude to you, but it harbors a subtle meaning which cannot be explained in words. I myself acquired it only after many long years, and even if I wanted to, I could not automatically pass it on to my son if he himself did not wish to acquire it. And I think he would rather take up another one. This craft can be traced back from apprentice to master until one reaches our Lord Seth, the son of Adam. It was he who first taught it to men. And what a prophet brings, for Seth was a prophet, must clearly have a special purpose, both outwardly and inwardly. I gradually came to understand that there is nothing fortuitous about this craft that each movement and each procedure is the bearer of an element of wisdom. But not everyone can understand this. But even if one does not know this, it is still stupid and reprehensible to rob men of the inheritance of prophets and to put them in front of a machine where, day in and day out, they must perform a meaningless task. And so that's a really quite remarkable statement. And unfortunately, much of the Islamic world has lost these arts. Fortunately, there's a movement among some scholars to recover this uh, to the extent that's possible and really uh, bring authentic Islamic principles of art and architecture to bear on these production processes. And I'll close with what's the optimistic note. Uh, and that is that there's a wonderful university called Wise University, the World Institute, uh, uh, World Institute for the uh, Study of uh, Islamic Science. It's an acronym that houses the traditional Institute for Islamic Art and Architecture. And uh, Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed, the, the uh, kind of the architect of the Common Word Initiative of Love of God and Love of Neighbor that unites both Muslims and Christians and really all of the Abrahamic traditions. Uh, is the force behind this school and his, uh, the head of the Royal Al-Bayt uh, Institute uh, is actually the dean of this Institute of Islamic Art and Architecture and they redesigned uh, Saladin's Mimbar, which is quite a remarkable uh, process of 1960. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but it's, it's really, in a sense, training a new generation to recover these arts and keeping that alive. And I think that's where the real hope for an integral development solution for the Islamic world will come. And marks a very important uh, uh, kind of occasion for interfaith dialogue and collaboration. Mm -hmm. If that was the analysis, this will perhaps be the altar call. <laughs> uh, and the American version. Yesterday at Lincoln Memorial and also Forge Theater, various groups were observing the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. I will revoke Lincoln to help continue reflecting on what constitutes 
good work and what constitutes good works in the sight of God. The year before he became the presidential nominee of the Republican Party, September 1859, we in the United States were severely agitated about the expansion, the continuation of slave labor. Lincoln was addressing an annual meeting of the Wisconsin yeah, State sorry, Agricultural I'm Society you know. in Milwaukee. And he began by identifying two very familiar groups of workers. One, he said, unpaid slaves and those who labor for pay, but both of them generally uneducated. The second group, he said, those who work for themselves, they have skills and they have education. Now Lincoln said, that's the old paradigm. That was the rule of thumb. But now, 1859, flattering the Wisconsin people, he said, especially in the free states where slavery has become illegal. He said, nearly all are educated, and quite too nearly all, to leave the labor of the uneducated adequate to support the whole economy. So it follows from this, says Lincoln, henceforth, educated people must labor. I don't think that was such a difficult argument to make that with a growing system of public schools, those who had attended them should not expect to become idle drones, but to be worker bees. Because in the 19th century, as in the 21st century, most people in the United States whom I know and know of <coughs> have this deep intuition that work is Good. In 1972, a Chicago journalist, Studs Terkel, published three years' worth of interviews with working people from washroom attendants up to lawyers. And his subject spoke about working with their muscles and with their minds, some in solitude, some in these regimented bureaucracies, working as newspaper delivery boys, working as airline stewardesses. And to summarize his unscientific sample of the attitudes towards work that he encountered, Turco quoted Richard Nixon. <laughs> the work ethic holds that labor is good in itself, that a man or woman becomes a better person by virtue of the act of working. America's competitive spirit, the work ethic of this people, is alive and well on Labor Day, 1971. We're not concerned today about slave labor. I'm going to leave in the shadows all those zones of prison labor, military labor, the coerced labor of women and children, and illegal migrants. And if we just limit ourselves to that sunnier field of uh, the occupations that we get to choose from when we're filling out our internal revenue service, personal income tax declaration, <laughs> name your occupation, I should mention that on my Form 1040 is the only place where I ever identify myself as a theologian. <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed to name our area. And this is important if we're going to tax income, we will look at paid labor. So the Internal Revenue Code and the forms have to exclude all the useful, satisfying labor of mothers at home, of volunteers in the community, all those creative, disciplined people who devote themselves to sport, to art, to hobbies for joy not for pay. They don't come under consideration. But I would like here, uh, for the remainder of this time, to include uh, unpaid labor along with the labor we do for financial gain. 
and try to think of both when we're asking about good work and good works. And I submit to you that Americans in general, uh, uh, well, let's make it bigger, the whole, all the inheritors of the Christian-derived Western civilization find work, paid and unpaid, to be fundamental. The French student of child development, Jean Piaget, could use work as the prior category when he explained play is child's work. <laughs> the negative corollary to this deep valuing of work is that to experience ourselves as jobless or idle drains our self-confidence, drains our hope. We may wear ourselves out working, but we worry ourselves sick if we're not working. <laughs> In this first quarter of 2012, we're into our fourth consecutive year when approximately 9% of the whole US labor force is not employed but it's looking for work. And that doesn't count that untold number of the labor force are discouraged, who are no longer looking, or are underemployed. A creative writer who has writer's block, the parents who are at loose ends because their children have moved out and the house is too quiet, all of those who are, they're also missing their work alongside the ones who are missing their wages. The ancient Hebrew wise men seem to know about our eagerness to work and the distress of unemployment. One who's simply in the scriptures called the preacher, he complained, what do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun, for their days are full of pain, their work is a vexation, and even at night their minds do not rest. This also, the preacher said, is vanity. And yet neither our Christian tradition nor the Islamic tradition clearly, while well, it's documented it so magnificently, can, can accept that kind of world weariness as being the last word. Both Bible and Quran know human beings to be created by God and endowed with capacity to accomplish essential work on earth. By our respective books, we understand that work has meaning. Work means something in the mind of human beings and in the mind of God. It was Ibn Khaldun who looked at human labor and made, I guess, a simpler distinction than what Walid was making. Uh, he said he could distinguish necessary labor from noble labor. Uh, crafts are necessary, Ibn Khaldun says. Agriculture, architecture, tailoring, carpentry, weaving. But noble crafts, noble crafts, because of their object, are midwifery, the writing of books, book production, singing, medicine. And I wonder if there's any correspondence between noble crafts, necessary crafts, and work done for pay, and work done for joy. If I think about the Bible's assessment of human labor, what comes into my mind is a kind of U-shaped trajectory. It starts high, goes low, and then comes high again on the other side. In the beginning, high. In the world as it was created to be, work was good. 
God set the man, the woman, in the garden to, to tend it and enjoy it. And then, something happened. Our disobedience, our banishment, turned work into toil. The toil that we face when we go back out into rush hour. The toil that we face too often on the job. Cursed is the ground because of you, says God. In toil you shall eat it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you are returned to the ground. For out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Precipitous downward trajectory. And yet, in his patience and in his mercy, even in the low trough, where we find ourselves. God gives humanity chances to reconnect toil with the purposes for which we're made. The arm for farming, tool making skill for engineering, an eye for beauty to work out our living spaces in this universe. So even here in this low Plain. Despite human wrong-headedness, there is space and time for us to enjoy now some of the just fruits intended for our labor. We can thank God, even here, even now, for tasks that demand our best efforts and that lead us to some accomplishments that satisfy us and delight us. These are foretastes. We're being prepared to look ahead to a place beyond death where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. So out of the you, an ascending arm, eternal joy, that upper prong of the you curve. This is the biblical description that we can anticipate now in those times and places when we get to live in a house that we built with our hands, get to sit under the shade of a vine that we planted. And one great principle that helps us live in this meanwhile, uh, maybe this is something like the purposes of the law. <coughs> John Calvin taught us to think about Think about our working lives according to the ends for which we've been endowed. Why were we given this capability? He said, the use of God's gifts is not wrong so, so long as it has respect to the end for which he created them. And what is that end? Our good and not our ruin. <coughs> created for our good and not for our ruin. I take Calvin to mean that whatever work contributes something to human health, human flourishing, human maturity, human completeness is a right use of our abilities. We have abilities. Our family tell us we have. Our our teachers, our coaches help us take our measure. The vocational counselor maybe tells us something. The psalmist says to God, what is the man that you should be mindful of him? You have made him little lower than the angels. You give him mastery of the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. If we have that much capacity, it's meant to be used. We're meant to care for the creation, this creation where we've been set. We're meant to care for our fellow human beings so that they can come to appreciate their creator, to thank him. So any work that in any way cares for creation or for creatures, especially human creatures, is good work. We may work with our muscles, we may work with our minds, we may work alone, we may work in a bureaucracy. We may organize ourselves in such complicated, differentiated societies that 
we seem to be like the tiniest electron in a motherboard of incalculable electronic impulses, or we may be the visible head of a great movement. But wherever we fit into the world's labor force, if our individual working contributes something to human flourishing, we can trust that it's good for us and good in the sight of God. This goodness of all forms of labor got a little rediscovery in 16th century Europe. It was the conviction of Protestant thinkers that uh, well, they had this image of someone calling, God calling to us, that our, our, we respond to an invitation from God when we go to work. Reading the biblical record persuaded them that God may call an individual to any sort of labor. And this was a protest. <coughs> this was a protest against a couple of things. A protest against the idea that our acts of piety, our acts of charity, would ever be good enough to earn the favor of God. It was a protest against a venerable judgment of the church that a life vowed to poverty, chastity, and obedience was a higher life, dearer to God, than one lived in the household, in agriculture, in manufacture and commerce. Martin Luther was the person who loved to uh, reinforce these ideas by shock value of his own life. So he and Catherine von Bora renounced their respective monastic vows. They married. And to make his point that God may call a Christian to any line of work if it benefits society, Luther, Luther claimed that even the hangman could do his work to the glory of God. <laughs> I've been told, I didn't see it myself, but in the same vein, I'm told that there's a graveyard somewhere in England where one William Smith for, is remembered for 75 years mending shoes to the glory of God. Today's ethicists know about the complexity of our large societies. Haney might not know what to do with it, but I think uh, ethicists, if he goes across the hall to the theology department, he may find they've been thinking about it. Automation and leisure are probably the problems that trouble us now, a bit the way slavery troubled Abraham Lincoln. The question to be asked, it may not take us very far, but one question at least to be asked about any line of work, and they all are subject to scrutiny, is, is it socially useful? I have a nephew who shaves milliseconds off the time required to register a stock transaction on New York Stock Exchange, and somehow he makes a living by shaving these milliseconds off the transmission time, and I ask, uh, at least to his father, <laughs> is it socially useful? Those of us who have to get up tomorrow morning and go to work want to know where does my work fit into God's working of all things together for the good that he intends for his creatures? How does my work fit into his glory? And if we have an answer, it will affect our motivation. There are Christians who seem to go about their work with fear, nagging at their heels. They seem unsure that the work they do is work meant by God for them to do. They have doubts that their lives are fit to be presented to God. A lovely man named Al Saliba owned a furniture store in Dothan, Alabama. Every Sunday, he used to insist on paying for my breakfast in the parish hall after morning worship. And he claimed, you're my fire insurance. 
<laughs> Al was <coughs> witty, but I detected that part of his motivation for the good work of feeding the clergy uh, could be fear. <laughs> and then, of course, apart from fear, there's this motivation of pure necessity. Uh, we do work to eat. We work to keep our families clothed. Uh, we work because people expect us to work. Work that might have once seemed good becomes toil when it's done under duress, and no one can find the niche where their work is wanted. The 17th century rural Church of England priest wrote a prayer for people ground down by their toil or left jobless. And we sometimes sing this prayer in church. Teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see, and what I do in anything to do it as for thee. All may of thee partake. Nothing can be so mean which, which this tincture for thy sake will not grow bright and clean. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine. Who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that and the action fine. Christians are meant to understand that it's not only buildings and ritual objects that we can consecrate to God, but also our research projects, our traveling, and the sweeping of rooms. Saying that we're working for the glory of God doesn't mean we're adding something that God was lacking. Our offering doesn't enhance God. God exists in glory. Glory is the realm where God exists in himself, but earth can reflect that glory. And so our work may also reflect, it may suggest, it may insinuate itself by his grace and be blended into his glory. And our work also will be tested, will be tried, be judged by that intense brightness of his presence. The rooms I sweep, the bathrooms I clean, are usually not spotless. <laughs> Yet by his mercy, it's possible that some element of our works will be found acceptable in the renewed order that God's fashioning for his creation as we labor up to that upper right corner of the curve. Rush hour is coming. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is in this workaday world, we're spared from the necessity of proving ourselves worthy by our work. But what about those who don't have work? The underemployed, the unemployed, and the unemployable. Walid spoke of the law of love. Jesus, who is for us a prophet and more than a prophet, taught us that we're to love God with all our heart and all our mind and all our strength and also to serve our neighbor as ourselves. But how far will that love require us to go? Jesus describes how far. He said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I think we demonstrate no greater love for our neighbors than when we guide other people. Obsolete workers, less skilled workers, tentative workers that are 
They're at the doorway of employability. And younger workers, to me, <coughs> our children, our students, when we guide any of these into jobs, if they're jobs that demand their best efforts, if they're jobs that allow them to give themselves away for the common good, we have loved them. And our last act of love might be to yield to those not yet fully employed workers sufficient space to land a job. We can dare to step out of the labor force when our time comes. We can dare to step aside because we trust that God values us otherwise than the labor market does. We can dare to step aside because we trust that God values us otherwise than do those who depend on the prestige of a work defined position. We can dare to surrender our status as job defined and fully employed people because over our span of years, God-given years, we've used those gifts he gave us and we've offered him what work we have accomplished. It's God's business to judge whether the work that we found was good. And it's up to God to see whether these works can stand the test of his goodness. And we can trust him to use other means besides us to complete what was begun. We give God the praise he deserves for any good works accomplished, because any good that we have accomplished reflects the goodness of the one who created, <coughs> restored, and empowered us to do what is pleasing in his sight.